This film is part of Rebel Wisdom's series, The Science and Psychology of Polarization. Scientist Stephen Porges came up with a revolutionary theory that links together psychology, neuroscience and evolutionary biology. It was called polyvagal and focused on the vagus, the longest nerve in the body, that links together all the major organs and also connects to the face and voice. For the first time, there was a theory that explained how our own body and mind are intimately connected to our facial expressions, voice and social engagement system, and therefore to others. How the vagus nerve moderates experiences of trust and safety, how we're curious and open to new information and experiences, and how, if we're not feeling safe, then we fall into defensiveness. We start to see everything unfamiliar as a threat and are unable to take in new information. So, Stephen, thank you very much for making the time for this interview. No, David, thank you very much for inviting me. So, in this interview, I'm really interested to talk about how your theory, polyvagal theory, applies to the polarization that we're seeing around us. Could you outline your, what, what is polyvagal theory and how does it apply to this subject? Polyvagal theory, from the perspective of our dialogue, is a neurobiological theory that enables us to understand why and how humans need to connect with each other. And if we don't connect with each other, what are the consequences, both to our body, meaning our physiology and our health, but also to our mental health? It's basically a theory that explains brain-body relationships and how we can manipulate our mental perspective by shifts in our body and how our mental perspective can change our body and vice versa. It's a, it's a direction of, it's a model that has bi-directionality between brain and body. And it enables us to, in a sense, create a science of how social behavior supports health and how being healthy enables us to be more social. Just to talk about what polyvagal theory actually means in, in practice. Just like to, 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 to sort of break that down in terms of the vagus nerve and sure. in a very simple way, how, how do we orient ourselves and how does, how does polyvagal theory illustrate that orienting process? Mm. Polyvagal theory has several features and we're going to go through a few of them. The important, the first important one is that it gives us a way of organizing our own bodily reactions. And it really emphasizes that the neural which really means the brain regulation of the autonomic nervous system, the neural system that regulates the, the organs within our body, followed an evolutionary uh, trajectory. So we had a very primitive autonomic system that really was about uh, maintaining uh, metabolic resources. So it was very much oriented in, if there wasn't enough oxygen, enough food, it just kind of shut us down. Okay. Then with evolution from these ancient vertebrates that had only one, a very ancient old vagal circuit, and that old vagal circuit was unmyelinated. And myelination is really the fatty substance that coats a nerve. And if it's myelinated, it can actually convey the signals more efficiently and more specifically. But in the very ancient vertebrates, they only had this older dorsal vagal system. But we still have it. It's the primary system that still goes to our gut. And the major defense response that the autonomic nervous system for these ancient vertebrates was basically shutting down, immobilizing, death feigning. Um, through evolution, a sympathetic nervous system came on board, and that one was a spinal sympathetics that came on with the bony fish. And you can see them moving and even stopping. So now you have an autonomic balance of mobilization through the sympathetic nervous system and immobilization of that old vagus. And then what you have with mammals, and this is the interesting part of polyvagal theory, is something strange and something miraculous that occurs with the transition from the ancient extinct, extinct reptiles to mammals. And that is you have a newer vagal circuit that's myelinated that helps calm or coordinate these, the older vagal circuit to support homeostasis and to enable sympathetics to work without getting you into fight or flight. But the other miraculous part is that the area of the brain that regulates that pathway of the vagus is not the same that regulates the old vagus going to the gut. 
it's linked to the nerves in the area of the brainstem. It's linked to the part that regulates the nerves that regulate your face, the muscles of your face and head. It regulates your social engagement system, your ingestive system, the way you touch and connect with the world. So it's really this kind of remarkable transition where our heart became connected in a neural way to the, the nerves that regulated our voice, the intonation of our voice, our facial expressions, and even our ability to extract information by listening. So there are muscles in our middle ear, our facial expressivity, and the intonation of our voice. So now we project our, our heart in our voice, and people know that, intuitively they respond that way. We project uh, our feelings in our face, so these become the important parts of how we make connections with others. But the bi-directionality, so that we're, in a sense, if a person is in a physiological destabilized way, their voice is very different. And we often, if we're good therapists or good human beings or good parents or good teachers, we know that. And we calm them, and how do we calm them? It's not the words that are powerful. It's how we use the words. It's the intonation of our voice. So polyvagal theory emphasizes these evolutionary stages, but also emphasizes that under challenge, under demands that could be illness or threat, our autonomic nervous system shifts state. It moves from this social engagement safe state and where we are connected with others, it moves to defensive states. And we have two defensive states, and this is really one of the important points of polyvagal theory. Prior to polyvagal theory, most people thought we only had one defensive state, and that was a, a stress or a fight-flight sympathetic state. And even people who had been traumatized, who had been immobilized by the trauma, their therapists would say, oh, you must have been frightened, you must have been mobilized. You might. They kept on looking for this sympathetic response, and the client said, that's not how I experienced it. That's because when we experience a life threat, for some of us, not all of us, our body goes into this very, very ancient immobilization response. We're very much like a mouse in the jaws of a cat, where the mouse will just literally pass out and lose all muscle tone. And many people who have survived trauma, their body has gone into that state, and they've not found a voice or had difficulty finding a voice to explain the mechanisms of it. So frequently under demands, our bodies don't support fight or flight. And in a, our culture, when, that doesn't, when we don't have that resource, the people are often blamed for not fighting or not fleeing. And so by explaining this with polyvagal theory, it provides a validation for many people's experiences. And how does that apply to, to polarization and to um, connection. Let's start with this whole notion you have polarization in part because there is some type of threat that people perceive or their bodies respond. So let's now deal with this notion of threat from a polyvagal perspective. Polyvagal theory doesn't like to use words like perception because perception is a very cognitive term. Polyvagal theory uses a term called neuroception which is the nervous system's decision or evaluation of risk in the environment. So if, the, your, if your nervous system detects risk of danger, you shift physiological state to be more sympathetically innervated, which gives you the power and strength to run or to fight. If you react as if there's no way you can get out, like you're enclosed in a small area, or you're physically much smaller, or, or your body might now move into this life threat shutting down response. Both of those are autonomic responses and our body has this capacity to go to those stages in an adaptive strategy to save our lives. So it's not like, oh, I gave up so I just shut down, now I'm really angry that I gave up. Your body is making that decision and once you understand that these are more on a neural reflex level, then aspects of shame and blame change. But let's move back to this notion of perceived threat or a neuroception of threat. If we have a neuroception of threat, our nervous system loses its capacity to be socially engaged with others. So we start to see others with a bias of threat threatening us. And then this goes into the next level, the issue of the world that we're in now, which is a very polarized world. 
that we have confused what it means to be safe. And that's part of where the polarization occurs. The polarization starts when people think that I can be safe if I remove threat. If I see you as threatening, you're not coming into my country. You're not coming into my town. You're not marrying my daughter. You know, it's all these features are basically we're going to remove the threat. But that's not enough. Our bodies want more. That will never make an individual or a community or a society feel safe. Safety comes when the features of safety are being presented to them on a day-to-day -day basis. The ability of people engaging them, smiling at them with positive gestures, the intonations of voices that are reassuring and witnessing, those make people feel safe. So it's not merely the politics. We have to also talk about educational systems. We have to talk about medical care. How often do do the educators, how often are they instructed or the medical providers instructed that the way they look at the students or their patients, the way they use their voice is as important as everything else they do. They're not, it's not part of the curriculum and that's what I think polyvagal theory could bring to medical uh, treatments and to education is the understanding that if you want people to get better, if you want people to learn, they have to feel safe in the context in which you're delivering your services. And how does this theory or theoretical framework apply to, say, conflict and mediation? Well, it defines conflict, doesn't it, in terms of that in conflict, so people feel that there is a threat or their bodies feel there's a threat. Uh, to have remediation, you have to provide sufficient cues of safety so that you now get into a dialogue. Now, a dialogue, by nature of being the word, implies some reciprocity in the interaction. And when you, do res when you have reciprocity in the action, you have a listening component as well as expressive component. So you have a witnessing component. So it, part of, I think, the major issue of conflict is that people don't listen to each other. So they're not witnessing. And if people don't listen to you when you try to talk or express something, or let's say you're even a child, and you're not being listened to, what happens to your physiological state? You become very uncomfortable, you become frustrated, and as you get older with those same feelings, you become angry and belligerent. And so we have to understand that being listened to, being witnessed, not necessarily being agreed with, but being witnessed and appreciated for what you're saying, is really part of our birthright. It's something that we scream to, to have. And polarization is, occurs when people aren't listened to, they're not witnessed, and they feel marginalized. And where do you see that happening at the moment in, in culture? I see it happening slowly. I see, to me, for my own experience, the shock has been the interest in my own ideas, in the ideas of the polyvagal theory, and the fact that people in education, people in medicine, and even people in philosophy became interested in it. So it's not merely the psychologists or the neuroscientists, the people who are living their lives said, ah, this is an interesting theory, it explains my experiences. Or what I would say to them, it provides them with a validation of their own intuitions. And I think what that is saying to me is that as we understand the neurobiology of what it is to be a human being, when that becomes our guide, then culture and life becomes better. I, I put on one of my slides a couple of days ago uh, a, a kind of modification of what DuPont, the chemical company used to say, used to advertise better living through chemistry. That was their, their slogan. And what I was saying was really maybe better living through uh, understanding neurobiology, better living through neurobiology. And what polyvagal theory is saying, better living through neurobiology. So rather than always thinking that our behaviors are all based upon intentionality, that we have a, a more sophisticated understanding that we have a role, and the role is to support our own biology, and that neurobiology is supported for being a human in terms of co-regulation or social interactions. What it teaches us is that to be healthy, we have to do lots of interactions, not all the time, but we have to have opportunities. And what that means is that what used to be called, uh, we like to call play, 
Play is a neural exercise. Social communication with each other is a neural exercise. And they have certain principles. One, they're synchronous in real time together. And the other is they have reciprocity. And the world we're in with social media and texting and all these other ways of communicating has ruined the synchronous and often the reciprocal aspects of it. And our nervous system gets retuned by lack of the available exercises. So as people are listening, I hope that the educational model starts to shift so that we start providing more opportunities for children at earlier ages to have neural exercises of these systems. Because when those systems of neural regulation start becoming more, uh, say, more tuned, more powerful, more efficient, we have better behavioral state regulation. And behavioral state regulation is really the basis upon which we can negotiate or talk to others and the basis upon which we can learn. So we can't sit in a classroom unless we can regulate our state. And we are starting to find out really that lots of disorders, including addictive behaviors, which are massive in our culture, are really disorders of state regulation. So polyvagal theory provides a different perspective for many of the attributes of mental illness and mental health. And you, you just touched on it a little bit, but social media and if, if polyvagal theory is all about the necessity for face-to-face -face contact and for regulating ourselves in connection with other people, what does social media do to that when we're basically communicating through a screen and we're... Well, it, it's an interesting question because for those of us who initially, our early part of our lives was really solely face-to-face, -face, uh, even the telephone wasn't that bad because we could tell by intonation of voice. Um, I have found that Skype is better than just talking. So, and I have become more comfortable with interviews even on Skype or Zoom. So these types of uh, uh, social media technologies are infiltrating our life. I don't think they replace the one-to-one -one interaction. I often like to say that we don't have to have these one-to-one -one interactions all the time, but we need to have some of it. So if we have a good uh, nervous system, if our nervous system has been well developed, with let's say good parenting, good friends, good social interactions, it gives us the resilience to then go off and do things on our own, to be bolder, to be more creative, and not to need constant co-regulation. So it is almost a paradox. The more opportunities you have as you develop, the more resilient you be, you are as you grow up, and the more bold and you can do with things. But is there a problem with social media and the sort of the low bandwidth? We're not face to face much of the time. It's very. Do you think it adds to the kind of division or isolation that we're experiencing? I, I, I think it adds to a um, misunderstanding of cues. <clears throat> <clears throat> where people are misunderstanding what people are saying and they may be listening more to the words and less to the facial expressivity and the intonation. Um, I think there are false cues coming out there. And, and, but I have children and they are adults now and they would argue with me that the social media plays a positive role in their lives and that they have friendships that are maintained because of social media. Uh, and they use it in a different way than, than I would use it. I, I'm not comfortable with using it. Like I don't use Twitter, and uh, it's just not my world. I use email a lot, and I do text occasionally. But uh, I think it is an hour of bandwidth, and it's, it could be useful if we have relationships already, so maintaining them. But I think where my kids are using it is really maintaining relationships with the individuals they had worked with before or gone to school with before, so they already have friendship relationships, so it's keeping them together. Um, I feel that the act of looking at a smartphone or looking at something, actually a small screen, actually forces certain physiological shifts, like up part of our face gets really cont contorted as we attend to it, that this is not a comforting physiological state. I think larger screens, uh, larger monitors, are easier on our physiology, and I think our facial expressions uh, reflect that. 
So if you, look, if you do Skype or something on a large monitor, the people's faces look reasonably normal. If you start looking down at this little thing, you're, you're actually struggling uh, and your body shifts state. One of the big light bulb moments for me when I was thinking about um, polyvagal theory and how it applies to cultural and political conversation was when one of my teachers talked about curiosity and how curiosity was a key value um, and how it's moderated, or how polyvagal theory can influence mm -hmm. the understanding of what curiosity means. Because yeah. when we're having a conversation with someone, when we're curious, there's a potential for kind of new information, there's a potential to change our minds. When we stop being curious, then we're kind of closed off and we're not available for a, a generative conversation. So there are important points you're bringing up, and let's start with this whole issue of, of availability or being available. I've been playing with this whole issue of vulnerability versus availability. And what we find out in certain cultural environments, if we feel that we're concerned about eva being evaluated, we're concerned about our own vulnerability. And when we're in that state of vulnerability, we're not truly available and we're not expansive in the way we think. We're aggressive and we try to hold on to our existing beliefs or knowledge. But when we feel safe in the environment, and we're accessible for a true interaction, then that interaction is much wel more welcoming for ideas that are divergent even with our own. So we listen, we witness, we may not necessarily agree, but we learn. So curiosity is one of the bonus uh, points or bonus uh, objects or bonus values of having a physiological state that is welcoming. If you're a defensive person, if you're a state of concern, and you feel that your role is to reject because that gives you power, then you'll never be curious. You know, I, I speak from a, a uh, history of being an academic, and academics know their power, and their power is not necessarily in being curious. Their power is being skeptical. And a skeptic is very easy to be a skeptic. You just say, no, prove it to me. I don't understand it. Now, that's not a very interesting life. Interesting life is to learn from whatever you can tell me. Maybe I'll learn something. Maybe it'll shift my views. But I have to be welcoming for that. I have to be in a, a state that I feel that it, I'm not going to be hurt. My body has to feel it's not going to be hurt, not really my cognitions. So this curiosity is really a, almost a, a, a litmus test of our physiological state. Can we go somewhere that we've never gone before? Are we secure enough to take ideas that may undermine the ideas that we spent decades learning and publishing papers on? So curiosity is a wonderful projective test. I'd be interested if you could just tie that curiosity to polyvagal theory. Well, for me, uh, curiosity cannot coexist when we're in a physiological state of defense. And what that means physiologically is that curiosity comes out of what I was calling the social engagement system, which has this newer myelinated vagus. When you're in the physiological state that supports the neuroregulation of the face and the voice and the vagal control of the heart, it, it basically dampens or contains our reactivity. So we can react, but it's going to be contained. We're not going to get violent. We're not going to throw things at each other. So you may challenge me. I may feel a little bit uncomfortable but my social engagement system will make sure that my physiology will not go out of a certain range and I'll be able to maintain the social interaction and we'll build on our ideas. So the, the ability to listen and to be curious is really based on being able to regulate your physiology so that when you're challenged, you don't go ballistic. So I guess the $64 million question is how do we control our physiology? How do we, how, is it easy to sense when we're getting uh, into one frame rather than the other and how do we, how do we shift it? Well, I, see, I think it's, it's really, it's almost, I think both of your questions are on some level, they're very profound and important, but on another level they're trivial because yes, people know when they're losing it. You know, they, and they project it to others. Their faces change, they lose their affect, it gets a flat face, their voices change. We need to be schooled to be able to understand this and detect this and to realize that we might have crossed into an area that triggers a response 
We need to not really understand the history of the person we're talking to, but we need to respect that person. So we need to have a little compassion and a little bit of ability to witness. But that should be part of our curriculum as being human beings. So yes, we can see this happening. Yes, our, when our body shifts state, our tolerance to sit still and to interact with other decreases. Now the real point that I think you are asking is, if that happens to me or happens to you, what can I do? I'm losing my physiological state, but in reality, I don't want to get up, I don't want to fight, I don't want to run. I want to maintain the relationship, especially if it's important for your career, for your life. And the answer is they're, they're really relatively efficient ways of rapidly changing your physiological state, bringing it back on board. And the most powerful one, or the easy, most easy accessed one, is through breathing. And breathing is powerful because if we extend the duration of our exhalations, meaning exhale slowly, the vagal effect on our sympathetic nervous system is powerful. It basically downregulates our sympathetics. So it starts to dampen our defenses. So when people used to say, take, breathe slowly, they didn't really mean that. They meant take a deep breath and exhale slowly. Because when you exhale slowly, there's a neurophysiological effect that's occurring, the vagal break, just like a, a break on a car, is now going down on your sympathetic nervous system, down-regulating those defenses and calming you down. So slow exhalations. What's interesting is that you can even have a dialogue and use that. So if people extend the duration of their phrases, they're extending the duration of their exhalation. And you can see this in certain dialogues when people take breaths after each word. And you probably have seen people like that. And what they're doing is shifting their physiological state to, it, it may support anxiety, but it also can support aggression. And the simplest thing is just extend the number of words you're saying before you take a breath. It seems when we look out, there's an ever-growing polarization, there's an ever-growing kind of spiral of polarization. Mm. What do you think when you see that? And what, what does your work have to illustrate, or what do you think is the key thing to understand from your work to illustrate that? Well, okay, when you see the polarization, and you see it every day, you just have to turn the television on, the first thing that comes to mind is why would people behave that way? Why would they be so hurtful to others? Don't they have a degree of compassion? Don't they feel the pains of others? And the answer is maybe they don't. And the reason maybe they don't is maybe they've had traumatized, serious developmental histories as well, and that they're really reenacting the trauma that has happened to them. Uh, and I think this is really a real tragedy in life because many of the people who are this aggressive to others, hateful to others, their lives have been really not, they have not been lives of co-regulation and love and caring of others. They've been lives of, of just trying to survive and often using the wrong metaphor. The metaphor for survival was, do I have more stuff? Do I have more money? Do I have more land? And that miss the real issue is, do I feel comfort, comforted by being around other people? Do I like people? Do I like my kids? Do I feel excited about positive things? Not about just getting more money or more things. So. It's a real issue of, for me, when I see this, uh, I feel that with great compassion about what are now basically people who are, I don't even like to use the word, perpetrators. I see this and I look at them and I say, this is so sad, their lives are so sad. But then I go to the other one, which is much more pragmatic. I can have the compassion for them, but I can't justify the amount of people, uh, the number of people that they're hurting, the impact on the lives of others. And that really bothers me a lot. So you can say I can understand that, I have compassion for, for what you're doing or why you're doing it, but I have a lot of trouble because you're hurting people. And how can you hurt people? And I think, I hope more and more people will have an understanding of this. I think the power of those who do that, who marginalize, who bully, who, who isolate people to humiliate them, treat them poorly, to gain power over them. I just hope that more and more people understand the, the, literally the vulnerability of those people and why they're doing that. 
and not so in politics where we're talking a lot of this there's always this pragmatic I can live with that if I get what I want and I think people have to just get beyond that they have to say this I'll never get enough if you're there I'll never get what I need in a culture it's not okay with me if you're hurting people it's just not right so we have to have some different levels of what might be called absolutes. So we start off our dialogue about the biological imperative to survive was to connect with others. And polarization is a violation of that biological imperative. And we have to literally draw a line, and that line in the ground is, if you start doing things that hurt people, it, bio, it violates the imperative of what we came, what we evolved to be on this planet. We are a connected species. And if we don't appreciate that, we are, in a sense, injuring the species. And we have to take on a responsibility. The bottom line is, I think, there are going to be more and more people having this understanding because now you have, with polyvagal theory, a neurobiology that supports the philosophical and, for many people, even a spiritual religious view. So you have a convergence of different orientations all ending up in the same point. And this is polarizing people, treating them as if they're not human, marginalizing them, isolating them, bullying them, is not how humans need uh, or have to, or should say, it's not really need or should. If they keep doing that, they can't be humans. It's almost like you violate what it is to be a human. So do you see it as an existential threat? No I, no, I don't see it as an existential threat because I see it as something that will dissipate because I don't think it's sustainable. The main point of the, of the argument that it's a violation of our, of our biological imperative is that it's transitory and can't be sustained because being human is very powerful. And this work comes originally from trauma, an understanding of trauma. Is, why does it apply more widely? Is it because we're, we're all in a state of sort of low-level trauma, or is it...? Well, what's interesting is my work didn't start at trauma. I'm one of the few people in the tra world of trauma, the world of trauma therapy or trauma theory, that didn't come f initially from trauma. I came from my, my laboratory science, and my laboratory science led me into a model, and that model was polyvagal theory. It was a model of the evolution of the autonomic nervous system, but it was also a model that showed that under challenges, the autonomic nervous system shifted states to more primitive and primitive states of survival. And so that is how it got picked up by the trauma world, because people who experienced severe trauma were locked in these more defensive states. And then polyvagal theory started to provide insights on in how you can move people out of those states and in a sense rehabilitate them to a more typical neuroregulation and with that more typical social and emotional behavior. So because it was a general model of how the mammalian autonomic nervous system works under challenge, it has great generalizability. So it has a generalizability not merely in the world of trauma, but has a generalizability in the world of education, the world of medicine, and what I like to see it moving into is actually the world of social politics or social justice is really what we're talking about because it's providing a different type of manual of what it is to be a human being. So it's not a, a manual that's based upon you know, certain principles of that are moral principles, it's on principles of what our body needs based upon our evolutionary history. And when those principles kind of line up with moral principles, it's a beautiful story. It says our bodies need to co-regulate. We need to feel safe with others. We need to be safe in the arms of selective people, not everyone. We need time together where we feel safe and we can, and this will help us grow and digest. It will help us learn. It will help us solve problems and be creative. It will help us be bold and will enable us to be curious. And what are the key things that you think people need to know about that your work sheds a light on? I think the, the major point they need to know is that when you shift physiological state, it shifts your bias of how you see the world. So if you move into a physiological state that is more defensive, 
you see the world much more negatively. And if you see the, if you shift into a physiological state that's well co-regulated with other people, you see the world in a much more positive, optimistic perspective. I think as people understand that, they'll start understanding the relative import, the relative way we see the world is so physiologically dependent that we'll go back to that statement, better living through neurobiology. We would want a life in which we saw the world in a more positive way and that we had a more positive view of our purpose in life, a more positive view of learning and curiosity, and a greater acceptance of other, of witnessing others and enabling people to be different than whom we are. Stephen, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Rebel Wisdom is a new sense-making platform, bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. That's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.